Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Anissa Brene, and you are tuned in to Select Conference. This is Mastery. Uh, we are in partnership with United Masters and Quality Films, and today I have the super, super honor of sitting here with two legends, two men who have created songs, who have been a part of the process of songs that are a part of the soundtrack to not only my life, but all of ours. So um, I'd like to just welcome my two guests, Dante Austin and Brian Michael Cox. How you doing? Yeah. Good. Great. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yes, I'm super, super excited to have you both. Um, this is actually a dream of mine. I was telling Dante just a little while ago, like, I sat here like, you know, what if I ever had a conversation with two greats like yourself? What would I say? Um, and yeah, it's hitting me. It's happening. So I'm <laughs> super, super excited. Um, both of you all are Grammy award winning. I like to give people their flowers while they're here. You know, we, I see the Appreciate setup it. behind yeah. you, Be Cop. We love to see it. Um, Appreciate it. But yeah, Grammy award winning, notable for work that we stand on couches two in the club, you know, burn, mm. uh, be without you, sweet mm. lady, miss you. Y'all have really come through for generations. Um, and I think even now you have continued to do so. So before we jump in, I have to ask, how are you all mentally with everything that's been going on in the world? Um, how have you been able to maintain, especially during this pandemic? You want to go, Chante? Okay. Uh, I mean, for, <laughs> for me, it's, uh, it's, it's been good. Um, obviously, the versus thing was a, a, a huge thing that, that took place during, you know, COVID. So that was good. And uh you know, mentally it's been uh, fine. I'm, you know, been at the house with the family. Uh, you know, I, I found out that I'm, I'm really happy with, uh, you know, my decision of, you know, who I married and, you know, and my kids. And I, I figured out I like everybody enough to be around them <laughs> every single day, all day long. So that's, uh, you know, that, that was great to discover, but no, uh, in, in a good place. Thanks for asking. Um, I think for me, it's been uh, it's been a a place of like reflection. You know what I mean? You know, we spend so much time moving around, and I, mean, I spend so much time here there, studio, doing parties, DJing, the whole nine, and hadn't really um, you know sat down and really reflected on like my life and what I really wanted to do and really get some focus. I think that you know I'm it's unfortunate what's happening in, in society. Um, but there is silver lining. The silver lining is that I think there's a great awakening happening with our people. And um, I'm proud to be a part of that awakening. And um, this has just been, it's been a good good place to just sit still. You know what I mean? I haven't sat still in a long time. So, you know, sit still, you gotta deal with yourself. And, you know, it's been, it's been good, you know, creating opportunities, you know, finding new ways to create opportunities that are out of the box of what you would normally do because of the situation. So it's been good. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Well, I'm glad to hear that both of you all are doing well. I, on the other hand, have been in the house picking up all kinds of DIY, YouTube, Pinterest, trying new meals. And Same here. I've even learned how to do my own. Okay. <laughs> learned how to record things on my own. Mm-hmm. Learned how to do my hair, do my nail. Listen, we are oh, wow. COVID free over here. Mm-hmm. Yes, literally was- everything. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I love that. I'm I'm staining my garage floor this week. I'm speaking of do it yourself, so I've, I've I'm gonna see how that works out. Hey Amen. Oh. We have nothing but time now. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, nothing but time. Nothing but time. Nothing but time. So well, know, look, I get it. I get it. In the spirit of um, you know, being in the house and Brian, Michael Cox, what you just said about having time to sit down and to reflect, I can honestly say I've been doing the same thing. Um, Spent a lot of time thinking about the things I wanted to do and the journey in which I'm on, which I'm sure a lot of creatives have been doing the same. Um, So that's really why I'm here now to talk to you both about your journey um, into the music industry. And I'm sure people ask you all the time, well, how did you get your start? And you're like, oh, snap, here we go. We're going back down Mm -hmm. the journey. But I think for this new generation, it's important to hear that this um, success that you all have is not an overnight thing. Um, it's all. been many years, it's been many, many years in the making. And um, I'd just be interested to dive in a little bit. You guys cool with that? Absolutely. Let's do it. Cool. So I'm just going to ask the basic question. 
how and what was the thing that told you I want to get into the music industry? I'll start with Peacock. Well, I mean, I've always been into music and always, you know, was into, you know, who was behind the scenes doing music, you know, like I always got you know, they make fun of me. They call me like a, and in other words, why me and Chanti are so close is because when we first met, we had the same enthusiasm and same like, you know, reverence for credits and for like who did what and who produced what and who engineered that. And, you know what I mean? So we would have conversations amongst ourselves in rooms. People were like, what are they talking about? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, but it's just, it, 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 I just always had, um, a love for the art and for the craft of it, you know what I mean? And it goes all the way back to, you know, when you're a kid and listening to Michael Jackson and listening to, you know, you know, Prince was out and, you know, my first movie I went to was Purple Rain, you know, it was just kind of, you know, as a kid, my big cousin snuck me into the movie to see Purple, Purple Rain. So it's like music has always been a part of like my immediate surroundings. Like my mother, you know, had, had a, was, a, was an avid record collector. So that's where I got my like first whiff of like wanting to know and understand what would you know, what, what is the music business like how do they you know how do they make this music like how does you know who's behind the person on the front of the you know front of the album and i remember one memory specifically was michael jackson thriller i remember looking on the back of the album and quincy jones had a logo on the album i never forgot that you know what i'm saying you know it's like you know it's three names on this album it's michael jackson Quincy Jones, and then there's an Epic Records logo. Like, so these these three people, like, why does Quincy Jones have a logo on the back of this album? I want to know that. You know what I'm saying? And as a young mind, I didn't really understand it, but I, eventually I realized that Quincy was a producer, and I started to understand what producer was, and you meet certain people that kind of set you on your path, you know what I mean? So it's something I've always wanted to do, even before I knew what it was, you know what I mean? Yeah, for me, yeah. you know, a similar story, similar, you know, trajectory, as Brian said, we kind of have, you know, similar upbringing and, you know, studying credits and, um, you know, seeing things like that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I remember, uh, you know, Michael Jackson, of course. Uh, but I think for me, it was like, uh, you know, Boys to Men, you know, like Biv 10, like mm -hmm. seeing, you know, Michael Bivens and seeing that logo. You know, the basketball with the Biv 10 around it, you know, and it was like, man, this is ABC, Boys to Men, uh, and MC Brains was was number 10 mm -hmm. for the, you know, for the for the founding core of, of, of Biv 10. So, yeah, and just, uh, you know, listening to records and kind of seeing those influences, the, um, you know, the same thing. I, I did not get a chance to watch Purple Rain. I was trying, my, my mom was going to let me watch it. And then my aunt was like, I don't think that, I don't think he's old enough to see this. <laughs> I remember being so mad, man. And just, uh, you know, cause my uncle was a huge Morris Day fan. So like, I, you know, wanted to see it because of Morris Day. Like he would pick me up from school and, you know, he, you know, we ride around listening to the time. And, uh, you know, he taught me how to do the bird. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't you know. <laughs> you know, okay. You, you know, um, but yes, yeah, so it was similar to, to B. Cox. That was like you know my early, you know, early education. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate that. I feel like this time during quarantine has given us a lot of um, a lot of moments to sit down and educate ourselves. Um, I saw in one of your interviews, Dante, where you mentioned that looking at credits hasn't really been the most popular thing to do like it once was a long time ago. I think the furthest that we've gone as a new generation is hearing the tag on a song um, mm, right. for that producer um, or things like that. So speaking to the credits piece, um, just what, what is your what are your thoughts on tagging a song now versus just letting the song speak for itself? Um, I mean, I, you know, th that kind of started in our, you know, generation. It may not have been as, you know, uh, I don't know if overt or kind of uniform as it is now, but, you know, mm -hmm. you go back to Teddy Riley and the Yep Yep, that mm -hmm. was that was on his records and, you know, Puff made sure to let you know that this was Bad Boy, 
mm-hmm. um, you know, Rodney Jerkins with Dark Child, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and then our good friend Jazzy Faye, you know, with the, yeah. you know, this is a Jazzy Fizzle production. Mm-hmm. Shizzle, so, yeah. you know, I, I feel he's like a, he's tagging. A, he's, a few, he's at a few of them. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like that that's kind of been going on now. It you know, um, it does seem a little more uniform. Whereas, you know, the producers of of our generation yeah. kind of added a little flair and some. It was it was different every time. It was you know, it was fly. Um, but yeah, you know, it feels I mean, like I, these I, tags are. Then it feels like these tags are starting to um, become like a lyric in the song. So like right. before Summer Walker comes on, is we got London on the track. You know, we we it's it's a part of the intro for me. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, right. and and so yeah, for us, like you know, Puff would do it at the end. He might do it at the beginning, but it always fit within the song and didn't distract you from what was going on. To me, I, I think uh, I think that when we got when we got into the whole you know streaming you know, services, you know, people started consuming music via streaming and via, you know, iTunes and got away from tangible media. I think it's just something that innately young producers just did because they kind of felt like they weren't going to get that credit love. You know what I mean? Because, you know, early on, you know, they just started putting credits on streaming services with the past year or two. You know what I mean? Like proper credits, you know? So, um, you know, you have people like Metro Boomin or Sunny Digital or, you know what I mean, you know, or London or, you know, anybody who's the younger guys who came up, uh, Mike yeah. Will, you know, they Zaytoven. had to find a way, Zaytoven, they had to find a way to let people know that they made these records. Now, where it became a little convoluted for me or, or a little complicated is that, you know, you would have producers getting on and then songwriters would was falling to the backside. You know, he didn't really know who wrote the song because they're not putting tags on the records. So you see a shift. The songwriters now become producers because they're actually getting the songs to the finish line. And you have somebody like a hit maker or somebody like a Sean Garrett or or uh, or Dream who, you know, well, Sean Garrett specifically has a tag. You know, I mean, he's a songwriter. He has a tag. Rico Love has right. a tag. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know, man. I, I, tags are like, to me, gifts and curses at the same time. You know what I mean? Because I feel like in the same breath, you didn't need to have Babyface speak on a record. Like you just knew that it was Babyface. Whether it's whether it was the was the melody or whether it was the you know that same keyboard sound we use on every song. You know what I mean? Same thing with Jimmy and Terry. Jimmy and Terry didn't have to tag none of the records, but you knew a Jimmy and Terry record when you heard it. Yeah. And if you heard something that sounded like it, he was like, "Yo, they're trying to bite Jimmy and Terry." You know what I mean, like you, you know, so. I don't know. It, it, the the gift in tagging is that the producer or the creative becomes more visible instantly, especially yeah. now in the time of like you know social media and stuff like that. Um, but I think that it leans to creatives to not be as original as they could be. You know, like a Timberland, even though sometimes he talks on records and you may know him. Also, but Timberland don't really have to talk on his record like to know that Timberland. You know, it's a right. Timbaland production. You know what I mean? <laughs> so right. it's, you know, it's, it's, um, and I guess the question is when to use a tag, when I use a tag. You know, I used to have a tag and I use it yeah. on a lot of joints that people remember me from, but there are a gang of records. Some of my biggest records, most of my biggest records don't, don't, don't have a tag on it. They're, they're records I made before I created the tag and records I made after the tag. So, you know, I think, I think that it could work either way, you know. That's a word right there. I think a lot of times now, like you said, because of social media, trying to develop that relationship between the producer, um, the songwriter, the whoever is behind the record using that tag is our way of saying, okay, I got to figure out who that person is. Um, mm-hmm. Because Lord knows my people, we, we tend to not always read often, <laughs> as often as we should. Um, so going into the credits isn't, isn't uh, as but but you know yeah, I do like one. what title is I do like what title is doing title they're doing like like yep. um, playlists like songwriter playlists written by mm-hmm. so yes. and so written by and yes. they're breaking it down and I I like that a lot I like that they're doing that. I know Apple yes. Music started doing it too I mean Apple, Apple Music did it first actually they did like a playlist like behind the boards but yeah, title right. joint is really extensive like title they, it's like they act they aggregate all the songs you've written and produced or whatever and they just put it in a playlist and it's like it might be a hundred songs in their playlist and you're like oh snap I didn't know they did that you, you learn a lot about 
uh, writers, songwriters, and producers from this list. And obviously, I think verses had a lot to do with them doing that. You yeah, know what I mean? You know, I was just about I to say that. The John Tay Austin yeah, uh, playlist is available on Title Two for everyone who wants to. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, it is. Well, speaking of, um, I know in the beginning of both of your careers, there were there was somebody in place, maybe a mentor, or maybe there was an opportunity presented to you. And I feel like a lot of times, um, for people that are in my age group, um, we're always looking to reach straight up to the top. Um, talk, to, talk to me a little bit about collaborating within your own network um, as opposed to saying, you know what, I got to get with Beacox. I got to get with Dante Austin. I got to, you know, I got to do all of these things when a lot of the time we have the people right next to us. Um, Beacox, I know you were, you were saying, you know, it can't, It started on campus for you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Really seeing a, seeing a flyer and flyer. going to take the yeah. opportunity and one thing led to the other and, you know, you got to match. We got what a party at. We got mm-hmm. uh, you know burn confessions. I think that's mm-hmm. that's just that's a big point, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Collaborating um, also, a collaborating is important. I mean, I also feel like you just have to prepare yourself for you know for uh, for an opportunity. You know what I'm saying? I think before that the opportunity presented itself, which at the time wasn't you know I. To the average person at that time, they probably wouldn't have looked at that flyer and said, "This is an opportunity." You know what I mean? It's just you know, on, 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 you go to I went to Clark in in the, in the, in the late '90s, and it, it wasn't unusual to to have street team stuff all over the campus. That was like when you you would start promoting. You know what I mean? For your records, you would start in the college campus. You know what I mean? And a lot of street teams would hang out there, so it wasn't odd to see a flyer or see, you know, just promo stuff everywhere on campus, especially back then, I'm talking about everywhere, on trees, everywhere. Right. Um, so for me to see that flyer and for it to be so specific, you know what I mean? Like, it was like, it, they weren't looking for producers neither, by the way. They were basically promoting the producers that they had already and were saying, if you're looking for banging beats, call this number. Now, I don't know who would be on campus looking for banging beats because people people at school are, are broke, and poor, and nobody buying no, you know, no Teddy Bishop, J Dub, you know, anybody can, can nobody afford no Noontime beats in 1997 at, at Clark Atlanta University. You know what I'm saying? So you have to see all these different things that happen. It's like that was like that was just meant to happen, like because it was a number on there, and I'm like, I'm don't nobody see this? You know what I mean? For me, also, I was like. I'm picking this flyer up and I'm calling this number every day until somebody calls me back. You know what I mean? But at that point, I've been, you know, preparing, you know, we, we working towards something, working towards, working on my craft as a piano player, as a musician, understanding what production is. I, I still wouldn't claim that I was really that good up until that point. I had a lot of potential at that point. I was a great musician, you know what I mean? But from a producer perspective, there was, there was so much I had to learn, you know what I mean? And I was willing to learn, you know what I mean? But I had a foundation, um, and when I got that call from, from Chris Hicks to meet with them, my I had a strategy. I think a lot of times people jump into this thing and they don't really have an idea or a strategy of what they want to do. Like you said earlier, people say, yo, I want to just get to the top, right? For me, I knew, okay, hey, I know I have something to offer, but I can't go into this building for people that I don't know that are already moving and on a high level and try to sell myself as this, you know, hot producer or whatever, where I know I'm not quite there yet. Let me put myself in position to learn. And one thing I've always known about life is that uh, work, hard work beats natural talent every time. I know, I know a lot of people who are naturally talented who still sing in their church. And could yeah. have had a record deal 20 years ago. You know what I mean? Just totally looked at their lives and kind of watched their lives pass by, expecting somebody to come in, get them. You know what I mean? Or oh, because I'm talented. Okay, cool. I knew that I had a talent, but I also knew that if I'm going to approach this thing, I got to show them, show whoever I'm going to be around, that I am willing to do whatever it takes from a work perspective to get to the next step. You know what I mean? And, I, and, and literally, that was my mindset. I didn't tell anybody this. I just was like, yo, okay. When I met Chris, he gave me an opportunity to be like an intern. I was like, cool. 
started interning, and then from there, it's like, well, you know, I could record sessions. You know what I mean? Okay, well, cool. You can record sessions. So I had an opportunity to record a session with Eric Roberson, and that turned into a next step. You know what I mean? And then the next step was Teddy and Jazzy seeing me trying to learn a drum machine. You know what I mean? Every day in there trying to break the drum machine down. And I think they were just like, yo, this kid is relentless. Like, this guy wants it. And if somebody else sees it, like you can see it for yourself, but when somebody else sees it, you you won't have to advocate for yourself. They'll advocate for you. That's exactly what happened. You know what I mean? Those guys started advocating for me, and then Newman was like, "Yo, man, hey, you know, I'm gonna give you an opportunity." You know, and all I needed was yeah. that that much. You know, I, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> all I needed okay. just be get in the building. You know what I'm saying? If I can get in the building, and also I was just intrigued with the fact that I was around people that were smarter than me, people who were better than me. So that made me, and I knew it, like I knew that, you know, Brandon and Brandon Casey were better than me. I knew that John Taylor was way better than me and more experienced. Too. I knew that. And I knew that if I, I knew Teddy Bishop, like, I, I, and I dissected everybody's crap. Like I was a fan of everybody's, but also would listen to their music and say, okay, why is this good? You did your research. Do you know what I'm saying? You know, I just sit in the room with Jazz and just watch him. Like people don't want to do that neither. People, people just want to jump in and just, you know what I'm saying? But if you have an opportunity to be around somebody like Jazzy Faye and he just sit in the he lets you sit in the room and just watch him, you know what I'm saying? I soaked up all that. I'm gonna sit in the room, okay, man. If you mind just sit right here, I don't want to touch it. Because I'm gonna sit right here and just watch you. Yeah, go ahead, man. And just watch him watch him. How'd you do that? Okay, all right. Ask you questions. You know, as yeah. the same thing. I got in the room with J dubs, like, okay, man. I'm gonna just sit here and watch. You know what I mean? And the same thing. So every First of all, how many producers was it, John Taylor? It was like six of them at the time, six or seven? Yeah, because it was yeah, Jazzy, Teddy, J-Dub, Ken Fambro. Dent? Uh, oh. Dent, yeah, yeah, so it was about um, five. And then, yeah, yeah, so, and then, so, and then, then John Taylor, Brian and Brandon Casey were, were, were there. So I'm in the middle of this, you know, this, this circle of creative people who are really just on a whole other level. You know what I mean? From obviously, I'd never been in a room that many people who were on everybody who was on a certain level. So I just soaked everything up. I mean, I just was like, yo, I'm sitting in the room with everybody. I want to learn from everybody. And I would take things that I learned and then try to apply it. You know what I'm saying? And I think that now, because things are so easily accessible, um, yeah. as far as like sounds and making tracks. So somebody was early, I was like, yo, like everybody can make, anybody can make a good beat now. Anybody yeah. can put together yeah. crap. You know, Amazon. my son, Amazon. 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 You know, can, okay. You know, you know, you can down download splice and get loops. I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's like anybody can make a good beat now. The issue is now, what's gonna define you, you know, what's gonna what's gonna make you stand out. And back in those days, oh. everybody was trying to stand out and have their own sound. You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. learn, learn, learn that you want to have your own sound, you want to develop your own thing, you know what I mean? See, I feel like you're about to take me to a place where you know you're sitting in church and like, yeah, that's good, that's good. That's what it's doing for me. So, so look, Dante, as a creative, um, I know a lot of the times for me, especially being in this industry and um, floating around because I'm a butterfly, um, a lot of the times we can feel like we're so good at so many different things um, and we're not quite sure what we want to focus on because it's like, well, I'm good in this area and I'm good in that area. So coming into the music business, um, you're a vocalist, you're a songwriter, producer. How did you define or decide um, what that thing was going to be that was just going to get you started as opposed to showing all of your cards at one time? For me, it was, um, you know, kind of a necessity. I started, you know, I, I first came into the game as an artist. I got a deal at 13 at RCA uh, Records, and uh, that didn't really work out. And I got dropped, and, and and Tyrese got signed in that same slot, and um, you know, so really, I you know was playing around with writing songs, but at the time, writing songs was my way to stay around music and the music business, and to stay around something that I love. Like you know, as as you know, Brian was talking about, you know, we we had the love for it, um, and so I was willing to do anything, um, you know, while I was waiting on an opportunity to you know, um, give my artist um, side a, another try while I was waiting on that opportunity. I was open to, you know, just doing music by any means necessary. And so if that meant I had to be a writer, 
you know, demo vocalist, vocal producer, then that that was the way that I was, you know, going to go. And then along the way, I realized that, you know, I really enjoy writing and 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 then that became the thing that kind of got me out of bed in the morning and and I, you know, uh, figured out that I was good at it. Um, so, but it's, it started as necessity, but from, from a, from a love of just, I want to be around music. I want to be around music and I want to do music in some capacity. So if I can't be an artist right now, I, I still want to commit myself to music. That's awesome. So real quick, cause I know that people want to know how old were you when you got your first placement? Um, because like we said in the beginning, the journey was long. <laughs> Okay, the journey is yeah. long. It doesn't just happen. So um, for the people out there who want that song on an album or want it on the radio, want to hear it, um, what was that age? Well, for me, I mean, I, I was a special case. I think my first placement was 15. <laughs> um, you That's know, and it was four. Okay. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the Wayans Brothers soundtrack, the Don't Be a Menace to South Central mm -hmm. while drinking your juice in the hood. <laughs> uh, that was my first placement and it, it happened to be a single as well so that that was also a blessing you know because a lot of people you know it's it's like a it's uh it's a journey to get a placement and then it's a journey to actually get a single off of mm -hmm. a project and so I was fortunate to to have that but then you know speaking to your point about the journey um Sweet Lady was about three years after that, about two to three years. So I didn't get another placement, mm -hmm. you know, un until that. You know, I didn't get another single. I had some placements like, you know, Jason Weaver, 702. I had a couple placements here and there, but I didn't get another single opportunity, um, you know, and, uh, until two or three years later. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's all, sometimes you, you know, I, I liken it to, um, it can be like sports, you know, you have some yeah. people who go, you know, a long time in the music business, you know, like some athletes go a long time before they win a championship. Right. And then you have some people who win a championship right off, but then it takes them yeah. a long time to win another one or, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes they, they never win another one. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it, it's that. And in the meantime, you got to keep working and dedicating yourself you know, to it out, out of the love. Like, you know, I just knew I wanted to do music. I didn't know that, you know, like, you know, writing the biggest R and B song or the song of the decade that wasn't on my bucket list. You know, when I was writing yeah. songs, I just wanted to do music because I loved it. And the point there is that you just kept writing. Mm -hmm. There was no stopping in the, in between. And so Beacock for Keep you, working. how old were you when you got your book? Keep working. Um, my, my first placement, ironically, I was about, I was, I was, I was 17. With, I, and I claim this is my first placement because it was it, it was a remix. It was a, a song for Sam Salter, a record called um, It's On Tonight. And it was a remix to that song. It was a remix, and back, this is when the remix game was, you know, you had to change the whole song around. It was all new lyrics, a whole new beat, whatever. And uh, I, I did this song with my guy who mentored me from Houston, a guy named Greg Curtis, a song called It's On The Night, and uh, the remix was called It's Getting Late. And uh, I remember, actually no, I was 18, because when it came out, I was already living in Atlanta. I was already going to college here. When it came out, I remember they sent me the 12-inch single. It was like, oh, you know, congratulations. You know, it was 12-inch single, and it was like, you know, first place when it was, I remember seeing my name on the back of the record. I was like, oh, this is crazy. You know, but it's uh, but my first proper placement, ironically for me, was uh, the proper one was Get Gone. So me and Chante did together my proper first <laughs> placement that was like me, you know, you know, by myself or you know, or with my under my circumstances. Because think with Greg was more of a he was like a teacher, so he he kind of led the way with that, you know what I mean? Creatively too, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I came up with a few things for the track, but he kind of led the whole thing creatively. Um, where we get gone was like, you know, me and Jante and Kevin, you know, and just kind of like noontime, like, hey, like this it, baby, you <laughs> know? And, um, and uh, so that's another thing I just realized me and Jante had, had, had in common, that 
you know, his first placement was not only a placement, but a single. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. My first placement with him was not only a placement, but a single. It would be a big single. And yeah, so that, that was like 19 when that happened. I was like 19 years old when that happened. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And for anybody that's too. watching this, um, I don't, don't let the ages, you know, stop you from <laughs> continuing to pursue your dream. Because even if you're past yeah. 15, 19, years old um that doesn't mean your time isn't still coming so keep sharpening your pen um keep going um my last question for the both of you as i like to do these talks to give people a taste of who you are um as opposed to giving them an entire entree because i feel like this is the perfect time like we said for people to go and educate themselves on the songs mm-hmm. that we know and love okay mm-hmm. um what has this business taught you and what is a lesson or a piece of advice you could leave for people trying to break in? Um, I, I think the relationships is one thing that I've learned, you know, from the business, the importance of relationships, keeping them, keeping them good, um, you know, and, and always, you know, treating people special. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, Brian and I, both one of our, our strong points is that, you know, um, you know, we can pick up the phone and call, you know, people that we may not have, sp- you know, may not have spoken to in three or four years. And, you know, the call is well received, you know, because we treated that person good. You know, we treated that artist good. We treated, you know, that relationship good. So I think just the importance of relationships um and and then as brian said the the hard work um you know to 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 the craft and the dedication to to the craft that's what you know that's what i've learned and and if you got a good team and you have someone who wants it you know so for you know me and b cox and you know even on the management side we had you know chris hicks you know and to have a team of people that want what you want as bad as you want it um, it, it just makes life so much easier and it, and it makes that goal, you know, easier to accomplish. And the piece of advice that I would give to young creatives is to, you know, starting out, you know, develop a relationship where, you know, you find someone who needs your services the way that you need their services. Um, you know, when we started out, B. Cox needed writers i needed a producer you know what i mean so it 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 worked you know and we didn't spend Mm -hmm. our time i didn't spend my time chasing after you know well how do i get on babyface's radar to write with him you know and brian didn't spend his time well how do i get on rodney jerkins radar to produce with him it's you know we found each other and we needed each other and we decided that we were going to make our own thing um, you know, so I would say find someone that needs you as much as you need them. Um, you know, and you guys go make history together. And Dream said something really significant during our mastery talk is that, you know, the people that you look up to when you're doing the work, eventually it will get to us. We'll see it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They'll, you know, so. we'll take notice. Um, so, yeah, just develop that relationship um you know i can't tell you how many emails and you know calls brian and i get like oh i just started writing last week when can we get in the studio it's like well i mean that's oh, wow. that's, that's, <laughs> that's you know that's not the way it really you know it yeah. really works i you know i say you know you don't just climb into the ring with ali because you think you can box um you, you know so get you someone that needs you like you need them and you guys go out and tackle the world and, and you know, and people like Brian and I will we'll see you at work, and we'll and and we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Um, and real quick, Brian. Um, I think that the the main thing is you know just piggyback off you know, what Jante said is just you know he rises he rises to the top. You know, if if you yeah. do the work and the work is good and gratifying, I mean, no matter what, you know, it may take it may take some time. I think people don't understand how much time it really takes to get to a certain place. I mean, we started young, but dog, it still took some time. Like John T. told you he was signed at what, 13? You know what I mean? Something like that? Yeah. So your first record deal. 
He made his first place in that 15, you know what I mean? Which was a single. And then it took him another three years to get another single, which ended up being a massive hit. So let's look 13 to what? 16, right. 17, you know what I mean? Well, and then so all the way to 39 before really the main, you know, the world found out about me through Versus. Like, so for, many people didn't like know this, who I was. Like, and I'm, yeah. you know. You know, yeah. so that's the thing. So just understand that this thing really takes time. You have to slow cook this thing as a marathon, not a sprint. And you have to be committed to it. You know, um, you know, I, I think that's that's the main thing. Um, I do want to add that, you know, once you do start seeing some traction, you start making a little money and start making some some marks for yourself, you know, respect the money. You know, respect the money you're making. You know, I think a lot of times when you start making money, you know, we, especially when you're young, early twenties, you know, start feeling yourself, and it's not, and it's not a bad, you know, it's not a bad thing. We all got to go through it, you know what I mean? But man, respect that money. Please respect that money. Okay. You know what I'm saying? One Ferrari Please. drives just as good as two. You don't need two. Absolutely. Just... <laughs> Bars. Respect that money. I always say, would you? I always say, would you rather be a Thanksgiving dinner or would you rather be a kid cuisine? One of them takes sixty seconds, the other one you actually prepare. So. Um, I appreciate the both of you so much for the contributions you all have given to the music industry. I can say without um, blinking, without anything, that you all, without your contributions, this music industry would not be the same. So thank you, thank you, thank Thank you. you, And thank Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. It was awesome. It was my pleasure. Thank Mm -hmm. you for having us. My pleasure. Yes, shout shout out to Mastery. Shout out to United Masters and Quality Films. Y'all stay tuned. You never know what we're going to have next.